A Farewell to Mars by Brian Zahn. Chapter 6, The Things That Make for Peace. You're not a pacifist, are you? I get that question a lot. People who have read my books or heard my sermons will often confront me with that question. There seems to be a hint of scandal implied in the question, like asking, you're not a pornographer, are you? This strikes me as a bit strange. I suppose the hint of scandal comes from the assumption that pacifism is a sort of cousin to cowardice. This also strikes me as strange. To endorse the dominant view that the employment of violence is compatible with Christianity requires no courage at all. That's just following the crowd. But to differ from the dominant view on the sanctity of state-sponsored violence may require an uncommon reservoir of moral conviction. Pacifism is not a popular position in America, and especially not among patriotic evangelicals who have ardently sought to amalgamate the American state and the Christian faith into one hybrid entity. Still, I know what you're wondering. <clears throat> What's my answer to the loaded question about pacifism? First of all, I don't like labels. Kierkegaard was right when he said, when you label me, you negate me. Just call someone a pacifist and you can dismiss them with a wave of your hand. Labels are often a way to avoid thinking. Oh, he's one of those. Case closed, mind closed. That being said, I have no problem with Christians who adopt the label of pacifist. If nothing else, they provide an alternative witness to that of the Christian militarist who number, whose numbers are legion. But I actually don't claim the label of pacifist for this reason. Pacifism is a political position on violence. It's a position one could adopt apart from Jesus Christ. As for example, the great writer and humanist Kurt Vonnegut did. But I am not a political pacifist. What I am is a Christian. And as a Christian, we talk about how Christ informs humanity on the subject of violence. In my long and winding journey, I've come to understand that to live gently in a violent world is part of the counterculture of following Christ. This is not something I would ever have arrived at on my own. I'm not by nature a gentle person. For most of my life, I have viewed violence with a kind of affection. In my youth, I got in plenty of fights. I enjoyed violent movies. Cowboy justice held a romantic appeal. As a pastor, I supported nearly all, if not literally all, of Americans' military adventures. If my views on violence have changed, and they have, the blame falls squarely on Jesus. It's not like I woke up one day and said, hey, I think I'll adopt a position of Christian nonviolence just for the fun of it. I bet that will be popular. No, that's not what happened. What happened was once the red, white, and blue varnish was removed from Jesus, and I learned to read the Gospels free of a star-spangled interpretation, I discovered that my Lord and Savior had a lot of things to say about peace that I had been missing. I was as surprised as anyone. But once you've seen the truth, you can't unknow what you know and be true to yourself. So let's talk about it. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we now call Palm Sunday was a confusing event full of contradictions. It was an incongruent mix of cheers and tears. There was jubilation among the Passover pilgrims as they waved palm branches and shouted, Hosanna! Passover was the annual celebration of Israel's liberation from bondage in Egypt, and the holiday had come to have strong patriotic overtones, especially for a people enduring the humiliation of a foreign occupation. Hoping that the miracle-working prophet from Galilee would turn out to be the long-awaited Messiah who would liberate Israel from Roman occupation, the Passover pilgrims ecstatic ecstatically shouted, Hosanna, liberate now. But Jesus was obviously distressed about something. While the crowd was joyfully shouting, Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem. Quite clearly, Jesus did not share the optimistic enthusiasm of the crowd. What was going on? What was going on 
was that a violent, nationalistic vision of the Messiah had made it impossible for the people of Jerusalem to perceive the things that make for peace. Despite their Palm Sunday cheers, the crowd ultimately failed to recognize the Galilean Prince of Peace as Israel's true Messiah. The tragic result of this failure came a generation later with Jerusalem's total destruction and the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. Listen again to what Jesus said as he wept over the doomed city. If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Luke 19, 42 to 44. On the Sunday of Jesus's arrival in Jerusalem, the crowd of Passover pilgrims waved palm branches and shouted Hosanna in a patriotic remembrance of the Maccabean revolt two centuries earlier. It would be similar to how Americans remember the Revolutionary War and celebrate the 4th of July. What they were clearly anticipating was that Jesus was about to do it again, just as Judah Maccabeus had led a Jewish war of independence against the Seleucid Empire. Now Jesus was expected to lead a war of independence against the Roman Empire. The expectation was for Jesus to be a kind of first century Jewish George Washington. The prevailing sentiment was a yearning for war, not peace. The dominant assumption was that violence was the path that would lead to freedom. When Jesus saw that his vision for the kingdom of God had been conscripted by a violent nationalistic agenda, he wept and lamented the fate of Jerusalem. The patriotic crowd wanted the second coming of Joshua, the Canaanite killer, or David, the Philistine slayer, or Judah, the hammer, Maccabeus. But Jesus was not the second coming of any Jewish war hero. He was the first coming of the Prince of Peace. When Jesus wept and said, if only you had known the things that make for peace, he wasn't talking about spiritual peace or inner peace or emotional peace. He was talking about peace from the literal hell that is war. Today, there's a tendency to over-spiritualize the way Jesus spoke of peace. By making peace primarily a privatized spiritual peace, we are free to carry the banners of war down the road and keep the world as it's always been. Just one more war away from peace. Now, all we have to do is win the war on terror and peace will prevail. Call me dubious. When the peace of Christ is confined to the private realm of individual emotions, it is not taken seriously as an alternative to political vision, as an alternative political vision for humanity. Post-Constantine Christians have learned to be quite comfortable in claiming the peace of Christ while waging war upon their neighbors. We have made the Pax Christus a private affair while holding to the Pax Romana as the only way to arrange the world. But I insist this is deeply pro problematic for those who confess Jesus as Lord. Christians may claim that war is a necessity, but they cannot claim that Jesus endorses this idea. Jesus was quite plain in teaching that a people who won't repent of or rethink the worn out idea that war is a legitimate means of making the world a better place are doomed to a horrid, self-inflicted judgment. The means never justify the ends. The means are the ends in the process of becoming. If the means are violent and killing, the end will be violent death. Jesus taught this. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. Matthew 26, 52. Prior to his arrival in Jerusalem, Jesus had been told about some Gal Galilean revolutionaries who had been executed by the authority of the Roman governor. Jesus' response is significant. Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. 
or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all of the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish like they did. Luke 13, 2-5. We have become so accustomed to interpreting all of Jesus' warnings of impending judgment as references to a post-mortem hell that we often screen out his actual message. Is that our subconscious intent? In this passage, Jesus was not talking about afterlife consequences, but was desperately trying to warn his fellow countrymen that if they didn't rethink their hell-bent for destruction, desire for a war of independence, they would all perish by Roman swords and Roman catapult stones. The nation didn't repent, and that's exactly how they perished in A.D. 70. Jesus was offering his nation a way of peace, a way that didn't end in a self-inflicted hell, but it would require rethinking their entrenched nationalism and penchant for violent revolution. The only other alternative was for Jerusalem to be reduced to a heap of smoldering rubble littered with rotting corpses, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Mark 9, 48. By the time he reached Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Jesus realized that, though his death would forestall a Jewish rebellion against Rome for a generation, eventually the drums of war would drown out his message of peace and thrust the city of peace into the Gehenna of fire. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Luke 13, 34 to 35, NIV. How sad. No wonder Jesus was weeping. But the saddest thing of all is that it didn't have to happen. Our looming Armageddons are always a possibility, but never an inevitability. Armageddon is only inevitable if we listen to the propaganda that comes croaking from the dragons, beasts, and false prophets of nationalism, empire, and war. See Revelation 16, 13 to 16. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because their fate could have been avoided If they had believed in Jesus as the Messianic Prince of Peace instead of a Messianic Lord of War, Jerusalem could have actually become the city of peace. Instead, they chose the path that led to a hellish nightmare of siege, famine, cannibalism, destruction, and death. The point is this. It wasn't enough for Jerusalem to hail Jesus as the coming king. They did that. They also had to believe in the new way of peace the coming king was proclaiming. Did you catch that? It's not enough to believe in Jesus. We also have to believe in the Jesus way. For that matter, I'm not quite sure what it means to believe in Jesus without believing in the Jesus way. If we don't believe in the Jesus way, we won't know the things that make for peace. Then we are bound to continue down the well-worn road to Gehenna and Armageddon, to Auschwitz and Hiroshima. Quite simply, it's not enough to just believe in Jesus. In fact, a reckless assumption that because we believe in Jesus and therefore God is on our side can actually aggravate our addiction to Armageddon. It's happened before in America, and it led to America's bloodiest war. Whether or not slavery was the direct cause for the first shots fired upon Fort Sumter in April of 1861 is a matter of scholarly debate. What is undeniable is that the fuel that caused the American Civil War to ignite into a conflagration that resulted in 750,000 deaths was two and a half centuries of slavery. From its Jamestown beginnings, the American colonies and later the United States, practiced one of the most brutal forms of slavery the world has ever known. The preservation of an institution that systemically dehumanized millions of people for the sake of economic gain was not a thing that made for peace. 
Inevitably, that kind of cruel exploitation would overflow its cup and unleash death and hell, bringing everything that is the opposite of peace. During the horror of the American Civil War, the land of the free became a burning Gehenna. 30% of Southern men of fighting age were slain on battlefields that saw the birth of modern warfare. From then on, war would be totalized and mechanized. The four horsemen of the apocalypse galloped across America, leaving a wake of war, disease, famine, and death. But in a tragic irony that will help make my point, a spiritual revival had swept through America during the decade before the Civil War. Americans flocked to churches and evangelistic meetings. This was especially true in the more religious South, where Christianity was embraced with greater fervency than in the less zealous North. Across the country, revival was on. Churches grew, conversions multiplied. People got saved, praised Jesus, and talked about heaven. Then they went to hell, or at least the same kind of hell Jesus had warned Jerusalem about during his final days. Despite a great revival, a nation of Christians was thrust into a hell of cannonballs, gatling guns, field hospitals, and amputation saws. Great cities were set aflame and fields were littered with thousands of rotting corpses. The fires were not quenched and the maggots did not die. What had gone wrong? Millions had accepted Jesus and shouted Hosanna, but they did not know the things that make for peace. They prayed a sinner's prayer, got right with God, and kept their slaves. They had a faith that would justify the slave owner while bringing no justice to the slave. They had faith that gave them a ticket to heaven and a highway to hell. The religious fervor in the conservative churches of the South only served to convince them that they were blessed by heaven. They were quite certain God smiled upon their deep devotion to their southern fried Jesus. If they had to go to war to preserve their freedom, so be it. God was on their side. They were sure of it. But there would be hell to pay. To help you comprehend how wrong the conservative churches of the antebellum south were, despite flaunting their faith in Jesus and clutching their well-worn Bibles, I'm going to enlist the help of someone who was there and saw it all, Mark Twain. In the chapter entitled, You Can't Pray a Lie, in Twain's beloved novel, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Huck Finn has helped hide Miss Watson's runaway slave, Jim. But Huck thought he was committing a sin in helping a runaway slave. Huck had learned in Sunday school that people that acts as I'd been acting goes to everlasting fire. So in an act of repentance, in order to save his soul, Huck wrote a note to Miss Watson and told her where she could find her runaway slave. Now Huck was ready to pray his sinner's prayer and get saved. I felt good and all washed clean of sin for the first time I'd ever felt so in my life, and I knowed I could pray now. But I didn't do it straight off, but laid the paper down and sat there thinking, thinking how good it was all this happened so, and how near I come to being lost and going to hell, and went on thinking, and got to thinking over our trip down the river, and I see Jim before me all the time, in the day and in the nighttime, sometimes moonlight, sometimes storms, and we are floating along, talking and singing and laughing, but somehow I could seem to strike no places to harden me against him but only the other kind. I'd see him stand in my watch on top of his'n, instead of calling me so I could go on sleeping and see how glad he was there when I come back out of the fog. And when I come to him again in the swamp, up there where the feud was and such like times, he would always call me honey and pet me and do everything he could think of for me and how good he always was. And at last I struck the time I saved him by telling the men we had smallpox aboard, and he was so grateful, and said I was the best friend old Jim ever had in the world, and the only he's got now. 
And then I happened to look around and see the paper. It was a close place. I took it up and I held it in my hand. I was a trembling because I'd got to decide forever betwixt two things and I knowed it. I studied a minute, sort of holding my breath and then says to myself, all right then, I'll go to hell and tore it up. It was awful thoughts and awful words, but they was said and I let them stay said and never thought no more about reforming. Huck Finn had been shaped by the Christianity he'd found in his Missouri Sunday School, a Christianity focused on heaven and the afterlife while preserving the status quo of the here and now. Huck thought that helping Jim escape from slavery was a sin because that's what he had been taught. He knew he couldn't ask God to forgive him until he was ready to repent and betray Jim. Huck didn't want to go to hell. He wanted to be saved. But Huck loved his friend more, and so he was willing to go to hell in order to save his friend from slavery. Twain did a masterful job of showing us how wrong-headed Christians can be about what, what constitutes salvation. For Huck to act according to justice, he had to think he was committing a great sin. For Huck to act Christ-like, Christ -like, he had to think he was forsaking Christianity. For Huck to love his neighbor as himself, he had to think he was condemning his soul to hell. Think about that a while. Mark Twain used his skillful pen to skewer the conservative Christianity of the American South. Though Mark Twain wasn't a believing Christian, and he wasn't, he was a prophet to the prevailing Christianity of his day. This was a compromised Christianity in desperate need of a prophetic voice. In seeking to preserve an economy dependent upon slave labor, Southern churches had embraced a fatally distorted faith. Probably without even knowing what they were doing, these Christians had quite effectively used Jesus and the Bible to validate their racist assumptions and protect their vested interests. They went to church on Sunday. They got saved. They loved Jesus. They waved their palms and shouted Hosanna on Palm Sunday. But like the crowd in Jerusalem 18 centuries earlier, they didn't know the things that made for peace. And Jesus wept over and America headed to hell. The churches were full and slavery continued until the Civil War, that is. Then 750,000 people died for the sins of America. This is more than a recitation of history. There's a lesson to learn here. When we don't know the things that make for peace, we can barrel down the highway to hell, all the while singing about how much we love Jesus and how wonderful it is to be saved. This should disturb us. How can it be that generations of religiously observant people can say all the right things about Jesus and still be on the wrong road? How can we know the things that make for a good church service, but not know the things that make for peace? Jesus said that something has hidden the peaceful way from our eyes, and more often than not, it's a flag. If patriotism simply means the pride of place that inspires civic responsibility, so be it. But if patriotism means my country right or wrong, it's a kind of groupthink blindness that hides the things that make for peace. Unfurled flags of nationalism have a long history of hiding the things of Christ that make for peace. Whether they are Roman, Byzantine, Spanish, French, English, German, Russian, or American flags, when they hide the things that make for peace, they are no longer the innocent banners of a benign patriotism. So, what are the things that make for peace? What is it we need to perceive if we are to avoid the bloody boomerang of a self-inflicted hell? Jesus told us when he said, In everything do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matthew 7, 12 to 14. 
The things that make for peace are the two great commandments, love of God and love of neighbor, but especially the second command. Love of God is only validated by a co-suffering love of neighbor. The golden rule of evaluating our actions through the eyes of our neighbor is the narrow and difficult road that leads to life and peace. The golden rule is the narrow gate. The narrow gate is not a sinner's prayer. The narrow gate is the practice of the Jesus way. The narrow gate is fulfilling the law and the prophets by empathetic love of neighbor in imitation of Jesus. When we hate and vilify others for ideological reasons, when we demonize and dehumanize others for nationalistic reasons, when we use and exploit others for economic reasons, we are on the highway to hell. We have chosen the well-worn road that leads to war and destruction. The deeply disconcerting thing is that it is entirely possible to cruise down the broad road of impending doom while singing songs of praise to Jesus. It happened on the first Palm Sunday. It happened 150 years ago in America. It continues to happen today. If we think Jesus shares and endorses our disdain and enmity for our enemies, we don't know the things that make for peace. And we are headed for an, for an inevitable destruction even if it takes a generation or two to arrive at our horrible destination. If we console ourselves with the promise of heaven in the afterlife while creating hell in this present life, we have embraced the tawdry religion of the crusader and forsaken the true faith of our savior. The road of nonviolent peacemaking is not an easy road. It's not a popular road, and it's certainly not a road for cowards. The road of God is on our side and he shall surely smite our enemies is a wide road. A lot of parades have gone down that road. It doesn't take much courage to travel that road. Just fall in step and follow the crowd. A marching band is usually playing, but it's also the road that leads to burned villages, bombed cities, and solemn processions of flag-draped coffins. Until the self-professed followers of Jesus are willing to forsake the wide road for the narrow way, the popular sentiment for the unpopular conviction, the easy assumptions for the hard alternatives, Jesus will continue to weep while his disciples shout Hosanna. I won't pretend I have perfected the art of following Jesus on the narrow way that leads to life and peace instead of traipsing down the broad way that leads to death and war. Far from it. I'm a newcomer to the steep and narrow path of peacemaking. If I'm not careful, I can find myself trying to climb the path of peacemaking in a far too unpeaceable way, which means I am falling on my face or even tumbling back back down the steep path. But But still, I know it's the right path. I would not have found, much less chosen to travel, this hard and demanding path unless Jesus had led me on it, onto it. I wasn't going to be led onto the path of peacemaking by Gandhi or Rumi, as admirable as those men were. If today I'm trying to walk the narrow path of nonviolent peacemaking, it's only because it's where I find the footsteps of Jesus. It's an uncrowded path, perhaps at times a lonely path, but it's worth traveling because I keep catching glimpses of Jesus farther up the road. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Book of Common Prayer. Amen. I'm reading the books that have been most helpful to me in my personal, spiritual, and theological journey so that their messages can be spread far and wide to help others. If you are enjoying and being blessed by the works of these amazing authors, please consider, if you are able, purchasing a copy of your own and giving it to someone else to read, so that the blessing of Jesus and his grace 
is spread even further through your gift and partnership in God's work. Thank you.